going to teach this morning on a subject that is not necessarily the warmest topic, and so maybe it is fitting for a day like today that is so cold. It's the subject of total depravity. And what do we mean by total depravity? We mean that mankind is corrupt by nature. And just how spiritually corrupt are we? Totally corrupt, according to the Word of God. And what I'd like to teach on this morning is something that Pastor Roxer suggested in light of the prevalence of uh, the new movement of Calvinism that's actually been around for several centuries, but it's undergone in the last generation or so uh, a, a new uh, wave of popularity. In fact, it was in 2009 that Time magazine ran an article and on their cover, they had this uh, stated as well that uh, they ran an article on the 10 most influential movements going on in, in the world today. And one of those 10 was Neo-Calvinism, the new push for Calvinism in the United States and all around the world. We won't get into the reasons why that's occurring today, but the fact is, it is happening. And we see the influence of it with Many who are especially of the younger generation, 20 and 30 year olds, who are, as they dub themselves, uh, the young, restless, and reformed crowd, uh, we see this resurgence going on today. So there's a need for this. In addition, the subject that we're going to study is intersects with the gospel message, as we'll see this morning, as you can't understand or appreciate the good news unless you understand the bad news of man's spiritual condition and why we really need the grace of God, and what Jesus Christ has done to provide our salvation. And so this is an important topic. It's an important topic because you need to be informed as a believer in Jesus Christ of what's going on in the world today in order to interact with this resurgence of Calvinism. You need to be informed about this so you don't fall prey to its false teachings and imbalances as though it contains some truth, Calvinism does, it also has some imbalances, as we will see, things that are biblically wrong and will trip you up in your Christian life and even affect your understanding of the gospel message. So in order to be a wise witness, in order to have a proper estimation of God's character that's truly balanced, we need to understand these things. Now, what is Calvinism and what is total depravity? As you can see, the acronym TULIP depicts five points of Calvinism, which isn't all that Calvinism believes, but the vast majority of it is summarized right here in these points, which were a response to Arminianism, the opposite view, back in the 16, early 1600s. But Calvinism teaches total depravity, meaning that according to their definition, man is so fallen in his sinful state that he is totally unable to even believe in Jesus Christ, apart from God regenerating man first, causing him to be born again, so that he finds himself believing, so that it's not a matter of first believing and then being born again. They actually equate total depravity with total inability. And as we're going to see, that is uh, categorically not true. The U in the TULIP stands for unconditional election. Election is being chosen by God. And according to Calvinism, you were chosen completely apart from your own will or choice to believe, for in fact, your will is spiritually dead, and that's why you can't even exercise faith in Jesus Christ to become born again. God has to regenerate you first, and he only regenerates those who in eternity past he unconditionally elected or chose. God did not foresee that you would believe of your own free will. He did not elect on that basis according to Calvinism. In fact, your belief in the future had absolutely nothing to do with his choice, according to the Calvinist view. And I think, right off the bat, these two points have major, major biblical problems. We're going to emphasize the first one today, because if you properly understand total depravity the rest of the dominoes start to fall in the tulip. But stop and think about this view of unconditional election, the you in the tulip. If God could choose, apart from your 
volitional response to believe in his son. He could choose who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. Why is it that only a vast minority truly believe in Jesus Christ and get saved if God so loves the world and if he doesn't want any man to be lost, he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? How do we reconcile that? I think there's an inherent tension or problem in Calvinism, an, an inconsistency or a contradiction that says on the one hand, those Bible passages are true, that God loves the world, but by that they only mean the elect world in the sense that only the elect are those whom God chose to save unconditionally. If he truly loves the entire world, then why doesn't he choose unconditionally to elect everyone? Why does he choose to only unconditionally elect a vast minority as the way is narrow that leads to life, Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says. So in essence, what you have is a God who really isn't loving. What kind of love is that? That if he could save everybody unconditionally, why doesn't he? You see, this doctrine goes right to the very character of our God. And we're going to start this morning with the T in the tulip. But by the way, I should go on to just explain the lip part of the tulip. But the L stands for limited atonement or definite atonement, as they like to say, sometimes particular redemption. Those are nice ways of saying, in essence, that Jesus Christ's death on the cross was only for the sins of the elect so that the elect could get saved. You see, Jesus Christ, according to them, died for the few, not the many or the all. The few on the narrow road that leads to life. The few who are elect. From God's point of view, according to the Calvinists, why would he waste the death of his son and the blood of Christ being shed for those whom he knew would never get saved because he hadn't chosen them in the first place? You see, there is a certain logic behind Calvinism, but it's a distorted logic that is not truly biblical. And then the I in the tulip stands for irresistible grace, that if you cannot of your own will believe in Jesus Christ and get saved, God's got to regenerate you first, and he unconditionally elects you apart from your own will, and Christ only died for the sins of the elect, not everybody else, then at the appointed time in your life when you have been born, come into existence, and at some point where God sovereignly chooses, he irresistibly draws you by believing the through the gospel as he causes you to believe it, but he irresistibly draws you apart from your will. In fact, they say he makes your will willing, which is a contradiction in terms. And he irresistibly draws you. And the Bible does teach that man has a will, and with that will we can resist God, and his grace is resistible. In fact, isn't it strange that even in the lives of those who are supposedly elect, why doesn't God just save them at birth because they were elected in eternity past unconditionally, why does he even allow a period of time in which their will opposes God? Why doesn't he irresistibly impose his grace upon them right at conception and save them from any period of rebellion against God? Calvinism has a lot of problems. The P in the tulip stands for the perseverance of the saints. Now, sometimes people misunderstand this to mean that this is synonymous with eternal security, and it is not. The perseverance of the saints says that if you're truly chosen by God, and God has given you his gift of faith to make you willing to believe in Jesus Christ, because that was God's gift to you, and God sovereignly imparted that to you, God will see to it that you continue in the faith all the way to the end and your faith will never fail to make it to the end or stop believing completely at any point along the way. If that happens to you at any point along the way, it proves you were never truly saved to begin with and you didn't really believe the gospel when you thought you did. You will persevere to the end in faith and good works and holiness, they say. And if you don't do that, you're not truly one of the elect. And so it has a lordship, works orientation that is not synonymous with the biblical truth 
of the eternal security of the believer. As it is our Savior who perseveres and keeps keeping us saved, not the saints who persevere. We are preserved by Christ. It is not our perseverance that ultimately causes us to go to heaven. Now with that background and that understanding of the tulip and the tea in the tulip, let's go on this morning to look at some foundational truths we need to understand before we even get to total depravity. We need to go back to the original creation of man in the garden. And that's why I had you turn to Genesis chapter 1. Because in Genesis 1, we see the foundational principle that man was created in the image of God. In Genesis 1, look at verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. By the way, if you skip down to verse 31, at the end of the chapter, it says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. In other words, God did not create sin. When God created man, sin wasn't in existence. Everything was very good. But as part of his very good creation of mankind, he created man in particular in his image. Not the angels, not the rest of the animal realm, but mankind in particular. And being made in the image of God, of course, does not mean that God is six feet tall and a 200-pound man, and so we reflect that physical uh, being of God. That doesn't, that's not biblical at all. God is a spirit, the Bible teaches. And what it's saying here is that mankind was made in the image of God in the sense that he has an advanced intellect, emotions, and will in the context far above the animal realm that he is to be sovereign over in this sphere of dominion that he has on planet Earth. You know, your an the animals, the pets you have in your home don't have the image of God. They don't have an advanced intellect, emotions, and will that are capable of a relationship with God. Though I am quite certain that my dog has a sin nature. <laughs> He's not made in the image of God. Why would God give us this enhanced capacity that the rest of the animal realm doesn't have? It's because he wants a unique relationship with us that he doesn't share with the rest of the creation. He wants us to be able to relate to him on an intellectual level to understand his thoughts as expressed through the revelation of his word. So man has a language capability that none of the other animals in creation can even come close to. We have the capacity to feel in a measure how God feels, and we have a will, just as God has a will. All of this was designed so that man could relate to God in a special way. Now, after the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, did mankind lose the image of God, intellect, emotions, and will on an advanced level? No. We're going to see this morning that the image of God was not lost. It was marred by the fall, affected by it, but not lost, as we'll see. Let's move on to a, a second point in Genesis chapter 2. A second foundational truth, and that is that mankind was created with a free will, but with limitations established by God. With a free will, but with limitations established by God. First of all, let's understand something here, that your will was given to you by whom? God. That's a gift from our God. But it tells us something as well, or at least infers it. Why would God give you a will? Well, it's because he wanted you to do something with it, namely to relate to him. You see, having a will makes you a responsible cre creature or creation. The word responsible means able to respond. 
And having that free will means God wants you to exercise it in choosing Him as God did not want robots who in a very deterministic, unconditionally elect way automatically served Him. You see, genuine love, genuine worship for that matter, ascribing worth to God, is not something that is caused or determined by God, but chosen by man freely. That's what really magnifies God. In fact, it depreciates God to say that God caused us to do everything that we do in that very deterministic, false concept of God. So God created man with this will, and it was a free will. In Genesis 2, look at verses 16 and 17. Actually, back up to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded of the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. That's grace. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That was a promise and a warning from God. And so what we see here is that man was presented with two options. You could eat from all the trees of the garden, and he was prohibited from eating from the tree of knowledge. In fact, in Genesis 3, we we want to look at that because of time shortage this morning. Man chose to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he did die in the day that he ate thereof. But right away we see in the garden... God gave man a choice because he expected him to use his volition that he had given him in making that free will choice. However, there were restrictions or limitations in the garden. God placed Adam where? In the garden. Presented him with his options. And what we see by that is that God ultimately is the one who not only gives us a will, but also sets the limits of what we're able to choose and how that will affect us. For example, what if God did not will to save everyone who believed in His Son, Jesus Christ? You could will all you want to believe in Jesus Christ and you'd still be lost. If God hadn't first willed to save all who were willing to trust His Son. You see how that works? God's will must supersede and precede our will in order for our wills to even be profitable to obtain the promised result that if we do believe, we will get eternal life. But who promised that? Who set that up? That was God. He set the limitations there. And I say that because sometimes you will talk to people, especially those who deny eternal security, who say, oh yes, well it takes an uh, an act of the will to believe in Jesus Christ and get saved, but after you're saved, you better keep holding on to Christ because, you know, if you stop believing or you're unfaithful, you know, you'll lose your salvation. You still have free will, they say. Well, is it true that you still have free will after you get saved? Well, of course you do. But just because you exercise your will, often in defiance of God, does that mean that you dictate to God what the results of your Defiance or unbelief are going to be? No. God is still free to say, you know what, even though you're my child now because you believed back there, I'm not going to let you lose salvation. Because I've promised that all who believe in me become a child of God, born again, and they're secure forever thereafter. So you can will all you want afterwards to give back your salvation. But I'll tell you this, he's not going to take it back. Because your eternal destiny doesn't ultimately reside in your hands for your safekeeping, but in His. And I'm so thankful for that, because if it resided with us, we would surely lose it in no time, just like our car keys. (laughs) Sometimes people say, oh yeah, well you still have free will, you know, you can choose to no longer believe and give back your salvation. It's kind of like that guy who decides, well I'm going to jump off the top of a building. And as he's halfway down and he sees the pavement rapidly approaching, he changes his mind and says, I no longer will to have jumped. But you know what? The outcome is fixed. (laughs) And God says, in a positive way, when you choose to put your faith in my son, 
You get eternal life, and the outcome is fixed thereafter. So God gives us will to believe. It was even free without any encumbrances, completely free prior to the fall. And Satan tempting Adam and Eve. But God sets the limits and the outcomes. Another basic truth that we see from Genesis is that Adam and Eve's sin resulted in death and a new inclination against God in the form even of a sin nature that is predisposed to do its own will contrary to God's will. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse 8 for another foundational principle. Genesis 3, we're going to skip over the passage where it says that Satan tempted Eve, she ate, she gave to her husband, and he willingly just took and ate. It was actually Eve who was deceived. But Adam ate, and because he was the federal head of the human race, and he chose to sin, all mankind is plunged into sin and death as well. But in verse 8, after they have sinned, and eaten of the fruit which, of the tree which God said not to eat of. It says, verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now why did they hide themselves? Whereas before they had perfect fellowship with God? It's because that was broken now. There was a separation that occurred between them and God. In fact, they had spiritually died. Verse 9, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Not because he didn't know where he was, but because he wanted Adam to own up to where he was and to what he had done. There was accountability. Notice an appeal of God to the will of man here. Verse 10, so he said, I have heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. There was a consciousness of the sin that he had committed, and a fear Fear now, not of reverence for the Lord, but a fear of punishment from God that wasn't there before he had sinned. So there was a separation that occurred, and that's what death means in this passage. In fact, Calvinism, if I could go back to this point, Calvinism misunderstands what death is greatly, and we're going to see this later in our study this morning, where as Calvinism understands death to mean incapacity or inability, the Bible over and over defines death to mean some sort of separation. That's why on this chart of the seven deaths of Scripture, you will notice that in every single case, under the what category, they all begin with a separation. What is spiritual death? The kind of death that Adam and Eve experienced when they sinned? It is separation of your soul and spirit from God. Whereas before they were on harmonious terms with God, sin now broke that. And they died spiritually at that point. And from that point on, they needed to be born again, become spiritually alive or regenerated. And as a result of their sin, the Bible says that hundreds of years later, they died physically, and their descendants died physically. And the result of, of Adam and Eve's sin is that all are born spiritual sinners, and that all die physically. And if mankind remains in a state of spiritual separation from God, right up to the point at which he dies physically, and his soul and spirit are separated from his body, then if that happens, and he's never born again in this lifetime, then he remains eternally separated from God in a place the Bible calls hell. That is the death that Scripture describes. That is what Adam and Eve underwent after they sinned in the garden. Now, a fourth principle that we see here from Genesis, a foundational principle, is that God took the initiative to rescue or save fallen man. Who is seeking who here in this passage of Genesis 3. Well, you got man on the run, he's the fugitive, and you got God seeking Adam out. 
God must first seek us before we can even respond with our volition. And it is a biblical fixed truth that if God did not initiate the process of seeking us out, we would never respond by faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. God is forever with mankind here on, uh, in his word. He declares that he is on a rescue mission. Jesus Christ said in Luke 19.10 that I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. What a beautiful picture of our Savior and the love that he had for us as he chose to come down from this sinful world. Why? For what purpose? To seek out those who were lost and to save them. That reflects the heart of God that we see described in Genesis 3 in the garden with Adam and with Eve and seeking them out. Now man does need to respond with faith but this in no way justifies in Genesis 3, this initiating by God, in no way justifies that man is incapable of responding to God's seeking and initiation. It's kind of like when it comes to, you know, dating. Maybe this is a bad analogy because, you know, to compare men pursuing a woman who he's interested in to woo him to himself, maybe that's not a good analogy as I think of men dating. But anyway, the principle is similar that if a guy is interested in a gal and he wants to marry her, what does he do? He seeks her out. He appeals to her. He tries to woo her and with her will get her to the point where she's on the uh, platform up here and she's willing to say what? I do. Just like God says I do, he wants those who come to him and his son Jesus Christ to in essence say I do when by faith, they believe in his son, Jesus Christ. But does that mean God hauls a bride to the altar and makes her his wife against her will? That seems like a violation, doesn't it? Just like a gal today has the right, you know, when some guy's interested in her to say, yay, she also can say, nay. Sorry, guys. You're not the one that I want to marry. And so the sinner today has the right to say, an ability to say yea or nay to God. More often, man says nay to God's wooing and drawing to himself. So those are four foundational principles when it comes to total depravity that we must keep in mind. Well, let's look now at what total depravity is in terms of its effects and how this even relates to Salvation. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 5 next. Is it really biblical and accurate to say that man is totally depraved? I remember several years ago, somebody was reading our doctrinal statement online. In fact, it turned out to be another pastor who contacted me and said, well, I think that uh, your use of total depravity is, is unbiblical and it's wrong and you need to strike that from your church website if you really want to follow the word of God. And this is a man who believed in the gospel. He had the gospel very straight. But his concern was that it could give people the impression that we held to Calvinism. Even though as you read in our doctrinal statement, it was very clear that we don't hold to the Calvinistic view of total depravity. We mean something different by that. And by the way, when it comes to terms like that, whether it's a term like repentance, or even faith, or grace for that matter, or baptism, aren't those things often redefined wrongly by religion? Yet it doesn't mean we should stop using them if they're biblical terms or, or principles or concepts. The same is true when it comes to total depravity. Is our depravity or corruption in the sight of God truly total? Can we say that? I think we're going to see at least six ways in which the Bible clearly says it is total. The first one is found right in Genesis 6 in verse 5. This is just prior to the flood. And it says, as God looked at mankind prior to the flood, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil Continually. Notice 
great in the earth, every intent of the thoughts of his heart, as God sees the heart, was only, only evil and continually. That's a pretty powerful description of the spiritual condition of mankind. But this was true of all mankind, as in Noah's day there was a global pandemic, as all mankind is infected with sin, and that's true even today. But Noah was, and his children and families were spared because of the grace of God. They were bitten with the bug of sin as well. But this sin flourished in the lives of those who perished outside the ark. Was it true after the fall that uh, the description of Genesis 6-5 was also true? Absolutely. That's why in Ecclesiastes 7-20 it says there's not a just man upon the earth who does good and does not sin. That was true in Solomon's day when he wrote that. It's also true when Paul wrote Romans 3 and he said that all are under sin and there's none righteous, no, not one. None who does good, no, not one. That's pretty exclusive, don't you think? That's why even in Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin, all with the exception of Jesus Christ in the realm of humanity, are snake-bitten with sin and are totally depraved, therefore. These terms that are used in Scripture describe the extent of the depravity of man, and it affects everyone with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second truth we see is that every descendant of Adam, except Christ, is a sinner in a threefold way, by inheritance, by imputation, and by individual choice. Man is a threefold sinner. What do we mean that man has inherited sin? Well, it means like, just, just like you inherit certain genetic characteristics from your parents, spiritually you inherit the characteristic of a sinful nature. Their nature was passed on down to you. Just like Adam and Eve then had a sin nature after they fell into sin, and that's why they started the blame game and they're hiding from God. All of a sudden they're sinning creatures because they had a nature now that was bent against God. That very nature is passed down through you to your children so that your children can say, thank you very much, Mom and Dad. But of course, you had no way of preventing that. It's part of being in Adam and his descendant. But you inherited a nature that in Romans 7, Paul describes by saying that I want to do good, but I don't do the good that I want to do. Therefore, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. What sin is he talking about? That indwelling principle of sin that we call the sin nature. That predisposition to rebel against God. We all have it. At least until we, are, we die or we're glorified as believers and we go to be with the Lord. Paul writes in Romans 7, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. That's in reference to, again, this inherited sinful nature. But we also are imputed with Adam's sin in the sense that his one act of sin was shared by us, or we share in his one act of sin. Why? Because we were in Adam. Positionally, he was the head of the human race, the federal head. And because he sinned and we were in him, his sin was put to our account, so to speak, imputed to us. You say, well, I don't like that. That doesn't seem fair. Well, can I ask you this as a believer in Jesus Christ? When you got placed in Jesus Christ and you received his righteousness, not your own, was that fair? You like that, though, don't you? How do you like that? You like it, right? So if you're willing to take the positive, you've got to accept the negative as well because it is a biblical truth. All sinned in Adam. It's kind of like in Hebrews 7, verses 9 and 10, where it says that when... Abraham, the father of the Israelites, uh, paid tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or later Jerusalem. That when Abraham did that, because his descendants were in Abraham, he was the head of the nation of Israel, that it's as though Levi himself, one of his descendants, 
was paying tithes as well to Melchizedek. How did Melchizedek do that, even though he came many years later? Well, he did it because he was in Abraham, and there was this concept of headship or identification with the head. And obviously, when it comes to sin, we also think of individual acts of sin. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So whether it's inheritance, whether it's imputation, whether it's individual acts or choices, just like baseball, three strikes, and guess what? You're out. Actually, all it took was one strike for Adam and Eve in the garden, and the whole human race was plunged into sin. Now, how does a holy God respond to individual acts of sin, inherited sin, imputed sin, man being a total sinner. Well, he responds with wrath. A righteous, holy God must judge sin. And for those who are in Adam positionally and dead in trespasses and sins, that's how God sees them. As he either sees someone in Christ today or in Adam, his wrath must abide upon them. That's why John 3.36 declares that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God abides on the unbeliever. Why? Because they're in a state of unbelief, and because they're in Adam still. And in Adam is enmity, death, trespasses, sins, and so forth, children of wrath. When a person gets saved, God puts them in Christ, and God sees them now in his own son, righteous, alive, reconciled, adopted, and so forth. Turn with me next to Ephesians chapter 2, where we see so far, we have seen so far, the extent and effects of human sin, that depravity or corruption of man caused by sin is total because... It is universal, and because man is a threefold sinner, and sinner in various ways, and because sin extends to man's very nature, to man's very nature. In Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at that classic passage on the description of our B.C. days, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others so he, he's saying here, look you Ephesian Christians, even though you're in Christ now, don't forget where you came from before you were saved. This very unflattering description of who you really are in the sight of God, because no one is born a child of God. In fact, according to the word of God, people are born children of wrath, spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Picture a spiritual stillborn, if you will. That's mankind in terms of his true spiritual state before God. Separated from God, but also with a nature that is opposed to God, a child of wrath. That's why that old, you know, rock anthem song from the 70s, early 70s, I believe, by Steppenwolf. Like a true nature's child, I was born, born to be wild. So let your motor ride. That song says it right, doesn't it? Children of wrath by nature, under satanic influence, oppressed, led about by Satan, with no exceptions, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, except the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. So depravity extends to man's very nature, but it also begins at the very moment of conception. There's never a time 
between your conception and your new birth, let's say, where, you know, you're only partly depraved. No. Or you become depraved later on, sometimes subsequent to your birth or conception. No, the Bible says that we are depraved right from the moment of conception. So in that sense, it's total. It's total. That's why in Psalm 51, verse 5, David writes, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And that doesn't mean that when she was conceived, she was committing the act of fornication per se. No, what it really means is that at the moment David was conceived, he was conceived as a sinner. Man is a congenital rebel. We have this condition right from birth. That's why later on, Genesis goes on to say after the fall, it says, Then the Lord God said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Right after the, the flood, he declared this. But notice, man's heart is evil from his youth. And even, according to Psalm 51, from the very moment of conception. And all of this also means that man is totally depraved in the sense that he is essentially and unchangeably bad apart from God's grace. Unchangeably and essentially bad, apart from God's grace. You see, left to ourselves, we would never be saved. We would never be able to change ourselves. And we still can't. God has to do the changing in terms of our character. Left to ourselves, we would be stuck in our condition. That's why Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In the Hebrew, that phrase, desperately wicked, literally means incurably sick. Incurably sick. That's why Ephesians 4 says that the old man grows corrupt. Your sin nature, there's no remedy for it. It's a different subject than the old man, per se, but your sin nature, there's no remedy for it. It just has to be lost or abandoned when we go to be with the Lord, when we die, and when we're glorified. So mankind is essentially and unchangeably bad apart from divine grace. How bad, you say? Well, bad, bad. Bad, in fact, to the bone bad. You know, these old rock songs, there's actually some pretty good theology in them, don't you think? <laughs> in fact, it's interesting how they line up with Scripture a lot more than even some modern Christian songs that are out there. <laughs> Being a facetious, of course, because we know that these old rock songs actually celebrate the rebellious nature of man, don't they? But in saying that so blatantly, they're admitting what the Bible has taught all along. The sixth truth when it comes to the total depravity of man is that man is completely incapable of regenerating himself, giving himself new divine life, or doing any work that can merit salvation from God. Doing any work that can merit salvation from God. You can't make yourself born again. You can't give yourself new divine life if you're dead in trespasses and sins God has to do that for you, and he will. Likewise, all the deeds that we do are tainted by sin, filthy rags, in fact, Isaiah 64, 6, and so they cannot merit salvation from God. Now, all of this is kind of depressing, isn't it? This is the bad news that comes before the good news. But I also want you to stop and consider this truth, that just because man is totally depraved, that doesn't mean that uh, every person is as bad as the next guy in terms of individual acts of sin. We're all as bad off as one another in terms of uh, our condemnation before God, in terms of our destiny before we're saved being hell, but that doesn't mean each of us are as bad as we could be. We're just as bad off before we're saved. But the good news is that God has provided a remedy. 
for this situation, this bad news that we find ourselves in. And that's why while we're in Ephesians 2, look at verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God's grace comes along and says, you know what, I recognize you can't merit or earn your salvation, so I'm going to do all the work, get all the credit, and do what's necessary to provide you with, as a gift, eternal life. But you must receive it through faith. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Here's the good news. Seeing in love man's need and his lost condition, his helplessness, his hopelessness, and his hell-bound state apart from Christ. And he said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to make it possible for all men to be saved by sending my son to die for the sins of the entire world. And he paid the debt of sin that we, we had because of our sin. He paid that on the cross as all of our sin was laid upon his son, Jesus Christ. And because the wages of sin is death, God sent his son to pay those wages, and he paid them in full. It is finished, was his cry upon the cross in John 19.30. And because he paid them in full, there's nothing left to pay by way of good works to satisfy the just demands of a holy God. You can't do any penance that would satisfy God any more than he's already been satisfied with the work of his son. In fact, your penance can't even add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's either accepting his payment for sin or trusting in ourselves. If we trust in ourselves, we'll be lost. And because a dead Savior could save no one, he raised his son from the dead to be a living Savior who could give eternal life who wasn't himself beholden to the wages of sin, namely death, as he conquered death and sin, and he rose from the grave. And the good news of the gospel is that anyone who, though they may be condemned in Adam, that's where we all start off, we're all born dead in trespasses and sins in Adam. Whoever is willing to believe in what God offered through his son, Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, by his resurrection from the grave, in giving the free gift of eternal life to all who will trust in him. Whoever accepts that message by faith will receive eternal life. And God will take that individual at the moment of believing and place them into his son Jesus Christ by means of the Holy Spirit positionally baptizing us into Christ, where in Christ at that very moment of faith there is eternal life. There's reconciliation. There's adoption as sons. There's justification. There's all the salvation blessings of God's grace instantaneously ours because of Christ. So which spot are you in? Which sphere are you in this morning? Have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ? You see, God provided for man's sin problem a remedy. What's the remedy for individual sins? The remission or forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. What's the remedy for the problem of imputed sin? It's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ put to our account also as a free gift. What's the, pro the remedy for the problem of inherited sin? It's giving new life to those who are born spiritually dead. Regeneration. And here's another R. Resurrection. For your sin-cursed body... One day, God will raise it in glory to be like Jesus Christ. You see, Christ's work made a complete salvation available to all who will simply trust in God's Son. So we've seen this morning what it means to have the image of God, that we're created with this, but yet we, as a race, have fallen into sin. We see that man is totally depraved in at least six different ways. We also see God's grace, how he provided a remedy through his son, Jesus Christ. But how does a person obtain that grace? How does a person go from a state of opposition to God to believing in his son, Jesus Christ? Do we have to be born again so that we can believe the gospel message? Does total depravity mean total inability to even believe 
No. In fact, turn with me next to John chapter 1. Where, we go, where, where we're going to see God's pre-salvation gracious work now that makes it possible for a person to even believe and be saved. You see, apart from God's gracious pre-salvation work of drawing, enlightening, and convincing mankind, no one would believe in Jesus Christ and even be saved. No one would believe in Jesus Christ and even be saved. That's why in John chapter 1, we see the, the pre-salvation work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 6, we'll see the work of the Father in that regard. In John 16, the work of the Holy Spirit, the entire triune Godhead involved in this pre-salvation work. In John 1, look at verse 9. It says, in reference to Jesus Christ, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now there's some debate as to where that phrase coming into the world should be placed in the translation. But the passage does say that Jesus Christ gives light to every man. His entrance into the world brought light in a world that is spiritually dark to every man. Enlightening is by Jesus Christ. Turn with me to John 6 and look at verse 44. Here Christ is speaking of his own relationship to God the Father. In verse 44 it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now this passage is not speaking of irresistible grace in the Calvinist sense, where you don't have a choice, God just makes you saved if you're one of his elect. He irresistibly saves you. It's not saying that at all. Drawing does not equate to forcing. Drawing in the scriptures is something very different. Now it does say here that no one can even come to the Father unless God the Father, come to Jesus Christ unless God the Father is drawing them. Did you know that you could not have come to faith in Jesus Christ if God the Father had not taken the pre-salvation work and initiative and grace of drawing you to his son Jesus Christ? Just like Jesus Christ had to come and enlighten the world that was in darkness regarding the gospel. Turn with me next to John 16. We've seen the pre-salvation work of the Son and of the Father. And in chapter 16, we see the pre-salvation work of the Spirit of God. Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Jesus is in the upper room speaking to his disciples. He's about to die the next day. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And the Helper, the Parakletos, is in reference to the Spirit of God. Verse 8, and when he has come, speaking of the day of Pentecost, his coming, Acts chapter 2, and the ministry of the Spirit in the church age here. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So the Spirit of God convicts of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He convinces. The Father is drawing. The Son is enlightening. And you have all this work going on in order to make it even possible for one to exercise their faith and believe. Now, did God have to do all of that prior to our belief? No, he didn't. That was an act of grace as well. That's why Acts 18.27 says at the end of the verse that he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. The way believers are described is those who have believed through grace. It's through God's grace that we can even believe. You say, well, how does this really work, this drawing? How is it not meritorious that we respond to God's gracious drawing? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever tried to get a hen into a barn? It's not necessarily a very easy thing to do. 
Now, in order to get a hen into the barn, and let's say the hen is the sinner who's running from God, and the barn is salvation. To cross into the doorway of the barn is to cross the threshold of heaven, let's say, and get it, be, be saved. So how does a sinner get into God's barn of heaven? Well, the farmer, who re would represent God, of course, could go out and try to, you know, track down every chicken or hen and, and just grab them and bring them into the barn against their will as they're going... Or he could try to do it by appealing to the will of that little chicken. Remember, they have a small will, not the enhanced capacity that man has in his will. So he appeals to that little chicken and... Because I know that chicken likes seed. Now, we'll see how spiritually hungry that sinner really is. So he plants a seed and let the seed represent the seed of the word of God, in particular the gospel message or truths related to the gospel showing man his need for a relationship with God and his lost condition and so forth. Well, let's say the farmer plants some seed here and the chicken comes across it and says, you know, I like that seed. I'm going to respond to that seed. And the farmer says, you know what? I've got to get that chicken all the way from there to here. How am I going to do that? Because that little chicken can run all over the place. I'm going to keep dropping seed all along the way and if that chicken is willing to respond to my drawing and the seed of the Word of God, that final seed I'll drop right across the threshold of the barn and the chicken will take that step and be saved in the barn. Now who's doing do we account the salvation of that chicken to? <laughs> God or man? Well, ultimately it's God, right? God had to draw, but man has to respond. We know that the door to the barn wouldn't even be open if it were not for the satisfactory work of Jesus Christ. You see, God appeals to man's volition, and he uses the word of God over and over again. That's how he saves so the gracious pre-salvation work of God <coughs> teaches that God draws, enlightens, and convinces mankind. But this is not the same as the Calvinist teaching that regeneration precedes faith. Remember, according to the Calvinist notions, spiritual death means that a sinner doesn't even have the ability or capacity to believe or exercise his volition in a positive way so as to trust in Christ. He must be born again in order to believe rather than believing to be born again. This, is, this Calvinist teaching is stated by J.I. Packer in the book Still Sovereign. He says, Fallen humans are totally unable to respond in repentance, faith, and love to God until prevenient grace, that is, the regenerating of the Holy Spirit, inwardly renews them. R.C. Spruill, another very popular Calvinist today, says in his book, Chosen by God, a cardinal point of Reformed theology is the maxim, regeneration precedes faith. John Piper is a little more expansive in stating this point, but he says, we believe that the new birth is a miraculous creation of God that enables a formerly dead person to receive Christ and so be saved. You see the order there? He goes on to say, We do not think that faith precedes the new birth. Faith is the evidence that God has begotten us anew. God begets us anew, and the first glimmer of life in the newborn child is faith. This new birth is the effect of irresistible grace because it is an act of sovereign creation. Now, is this what the Bible teaches? Not at all. Turn with me back to John chapter 1. We'll look at just a couple more passages this morning before we close. And as you're turning there, let me remind you what Acts 16, 30, and 31 says. In that famous passage where the condition for being saved is stated so succinctly, the Philippian jailer is in jail and he says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 30. 
What is the response of Paul and Silas in verse 31? To sirs, what must I do to be saved? Do they say, according to Calvinism, oh, well, you can do nothing to be saved. Don't do anything. You're not even capable of doing anything. Just wait for God to regenerate you. No, what is the response of verse 31? They said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe there is a aorist, active voice, imperative mood verb, meaning that they had to actively choose to believe the command that is given for the one condition to get eternal life. And that's why as you look at Scripture, in the New Testament especially, over and over you will see that believing is in the active voice. Now if man is so incapable in his total depravity and deadness of believing, how do you explain God walking up to a corpse in a casket like at a funeral and talking to the corpse and saying, now, now believe? That would be ludicrous, wouldn't it? In essence, that's what you have Calvinism doing. No, God appeals to people to believe because he knows they still have a volition that works. And they can believe, especially because he's removing all the clutter around and he's drawing them, but that threshold has to be crossed by their volition. That's why in John 1, look with me at verse 12 and 13. It says, but as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Notice you have to receive him, and the way you receive him is by believing in him. That's how you become born again or a child of God. Verse 13, in reference to these children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, ultimately it's God's will that in response to the believer who wills to believe in, in God or Jesus Christ, God says, I am going to now will that you be born again. I'm going to push the regeneration button and you get new life. Now, had God not willed to do that, every believer in Jesus Christ would still be without the new birth. But first, man must will or believe. There's man's responsibility, verse 12. And verse 13 says, God regenerates. God's responsibility. Notice it's not the believing that is all done by God's will. It's the regenerating of verse 13 that is done all by God's will. Man cannot will or make himself to be regenerated. This must come from God. But do you see the order there? Why isn't, according to the Calvinist view, Verse 13, back up where verse 12 is. First you have believing, then you have regeneration. Look with me at John 3. In John 3, this famous passage, this evangelistic passage of verse 16, we'll back up to verse 14 where Jesus is giving an illustration to Nicodemus, and he says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Notice, believing precedes eternal life. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There you see the divine order once again. Believe and receive eternal life. Notice the order is first look, then live. The passage does not say first you get eternal life or you live and then you look to Jesus Christ. So regeneration always follows believing according to the New Testament pattern. Now there are those who teach, Calvinists in particular, but again, man, because he is spiritually dead, he cannot positively choose any aspect of God's will, including believing in Jesus Christ. J.I. Packer says this in this quote up here. He says, the metaphor of death conveys this point of Calvinism. But what is the problem with that? 
What's the problem with the way they understand the corpse analogy or spiritual death, in other words? Well, the problem is that though that corpse cannot exercise positively volition to believe in God and get saved, you know what else it can't do? It can't exercise volition the other way either because it has no volition. The analogy completely breaks down. It's kind of like those who say, you know, the Christian life is about the do's and the don'ts and you're spiritual by what you don't do if you avoid the nasty nine and the filthy five and the dirty dozen, you're spiritual. Do you know there's a city in the United States of America with <coughs> over three million people in it who don't murder, steal, lie, cheat, etc.? Ever. Day after day after day. Sounds like a great place to live, don't you think? What is this city? Well, it's Queens, New York. Queens, New York? Yeah, you see, in Queens, New York is the largest cemetery in the United States of America called Calvary Cemetery with over three million bodies interred there who do none of those things. They're dead, but they also can't do anything positive either. By the way, as we think of deadness, do you know that even after a bee or a wasp dies, it can still sting you? Remember as a kid, your parents warned you about that? Don't pick up a dead bee. It still has venom in it and it still might sting you. So the whole point that Calvinists have about death really breaks down. They also say that because man in his will is in bondage, he's a spiritual slave. Therefore, as a slave, he can't positively exercise volition to believe. That's not true either. What about the slaves in the Confederate States before the Civil War? They had the ability to make a choice to step off the plantation, didn't they? Now, granted, the analogy breaks down. They had to work their way to, you know, the Underground Railroad where they met up with them. The Underground Railroad took them off to freedom. But still, they had a will that was able to be exercised. Just because we are in bondage to sin doesn't mean we can't still take that step of faith in response to God's drawing. Sometimes Calvinists use the analogy of creation. And they say that a new creation is just like being a new creation in Christ is just like be our physical creation when we came into existence. You can't create yourself. God must do all the recreating, placing us in Christ. Well, that's partly true. He places us in Christ. He makes us a new creation. But do we have anything to do with it? Here's where the analogy breaks down. You see, when it comes to your coming into existence, before you're in existence, you don't have a will again to either exercise it positively or negatively. Or for your will to even be in bondage to sin so that you only choose what is negative. Again, the analogy breaks down. Calvinists sometimes use the analogy of the birth process, the physical birth. They say, well, just like you didn't birth yourself physically, so now when it comes to the new birth, God does everything. Now, does God regenerate you? Yes. But does that mean he makes you believe? No. That's where it breaks down. Now, it's true that a baby cannot resist the birth process of the mother, and regeneration is all God's doing. That's true. But the person who is alive, who's out here in the sphere of those who have been born, we have alternatives that we must choose between as we exercise our will. That baby who's being born doesn't have that alternative. So that analogy breaks down. Now let's dispel another Calvinist misunderstanding or myth while we're at it. Tied into this idea of uh, redefinition of death, creation, slavery, birth, and so forth, is the idea that if you have to believe in Jesus Christ, that's meritorious somehow. That's a work. And therefore, you have to be born again and saved before you can believe. That is not what the Bible teaches. According to the Bible, believing in Christ is not a work since it is the only response to God that is consistent with grace. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes. Let that 
phrase sink into your thinking for a moment. Believing is not a work. So therefore, it's not meritorious. It's okay to do it before you're born again. In fact, you must do it. It's non-meritorious, and it's the only thing consistent with grace when it comes to salvation, and they fit grace and faith uh, like hand and glove because faith in Jesus Christ relies upon Him to do all the work and obtain the merit of saving. Faith is the empty hand that receives the free gift of eternal life. It's not the working, clasping hand. It's like a street person who you would walk up to and give a $10 bill to to help provide for his needs. That street person doesn't boast in the fact that, oh, my hand grasped the $10 bill that you just handed me. No, all the credit goes to the giver. And the same is true when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ. So we return now to the foundational point that we started with about the image of God and the will of man. Let me just make a few points in closing here and we'll wrap this up. Though the image of God, including man's will, has been defaced due to sin, it has not been erased. We live in a fallen world, that's true, but man still has the capacity and ability to believe of his own volition. That's why even after Genesis 3 and the fall into sin, you see several passages that say man still is in the image of God. You all know what this is, right? If I were to ask you, what is it? The Sphinx. It's been defaced in this world, but it's still recognizable, isn't it? And the same is true when it comes to the will of man. As a result of retaining the image of God and God's gracious pre-salvation work, we also see that we as men are capable of responsibly exercising our volition by believing in Christ in order to be saved. Read Acts 10, verse chapter uh, 10 and 11, and you'll see the example of Cornelius there, who though he was not yet saved, chapter 11, verses 13 and 14 state, yet God heard his prayers recognized his alms, which didn't save him, of course, but reflected he had a positive volition towards God. So God sent an angel to Peter, said, I want you to take the gospel, Peter, to Cornelius, and when Cornelius hears it, he's going to believe it and be saved. And that's how God works. Does man have to use his will to believe? In the very last chapter of the Bible, as the Bible's coming to a close, God makes a great evangelistic invitation in chapter 22, verse 17, it says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And by the way, who's the Bride? The Bride of Jesus Christ is the church. That's you and me. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, that's spiritually speaking, of course, come. Come where? Come to Jesus Christ to receive the water of life. And that's why God says, And whosoever wills, whosoever is willing, it could be translated, let him take of the water of life freely. Notice, willing must precede having the life. God does appeal to our will. So how does all this apply to you here this morning? Well, if you're here today and you're unsaved, you don't ever have to wonder if God wants you to be saved, that Jesus Christ died for you, he certainly did, that God's grace is sufficient for you to be saved, it certainly is or that you're even able to believe, you certainly are. In fact, you can believe, and you must. God chooses to save those who choose to trust His Son. If you're here today and you're saved, let me just appeal to you again, beware of these false teachings that are out there, lest you fall prey to them and become ensnared by human tradition, Colossians 2.8 teaches. But let me also appeal to you that you are the bride of Jesus Christ. Is your message to the lost the same as Revelation 22, 17? Do you appeal to the world that if they're willing, they can take the water of life freely and be saved? Dear church, dear saints, that is our message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth we've seen today. I pray, Father, that your spirit would make it clear in our